let me start so uh, the, the zoom is now uh, live streamed one minute i let me stop uh, this screen and So I think uh, you're all uh, seeing the screen now. Uh, welcome all of you. And uh, to start uh, the presentation today, we have a, a message uh, to be conveyed uh, that is upset. Uh, think that uh, the, the demise of uh, Dr. Mukta Sharma, the principal of uh, pharmacy college in Madhya Pradesh, and that is due to some brutal attack of some uh, notorious student and the, uh, on behalf of uh, IPGA and the management of our pharmacy college, the students, staff, uh, all are uh, very uh, sad to, uh, uh, can you please uh, stop sharing uh, that publication? Right. Yes, sir. So this is uh, the homage that we pay uh, to Dr. Vimukta Sharma by from uh, the bottom of our heart, our hearty condolences to the family, friends, and all. So by submitting uh, uh, homage by one minute silent prayer, we can move on to the next part of this webinar. Please keep silent for one minute and pray for the soul to rest in peace. So, as usual, uh, we'll start with a small prayer of uh, Master Aswati. Thank you all of you. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Murli Krishnan Dansegaran, uh, who is a B-Farm from Anamala University, M-Farm from Jadhopur University, and PhD from Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. He has done his postdoctoral experience from the uh, Department of uh, Pharmacology, School of Medicine in uh, uh, Maha, and uh, he has uh, uh, the research instruction in the uh, Department of Physiology, Pharmacology, and Therapeutics in the uh, School of Medicine, University of North Dakota. He is a research assistant, uh, uh, professor of pharmacology, School of Medicine in Texas Temple. And he's a professor now in uh, Department of Pharmacology, Harrison College of Pharmacy, Auburn University, Auburn, Alabama, US. He has a very fantastic laboratory, which uh, is, uh, has developed and uh, validated several in vitro and in vivo models to understand the etiopathologies eti and various neurological disorders. Using these models, he has investigated the novel uh, synthetic and botanicals for the neuroprotective activities and elucidated their behavioral changes, biochemical, neurochemical effects, and pharmacodynamic actions attributed towards the therapeutic effects. He has uh, uh, 
published several articles. He has written several books, two books and uh, several book chapters, and he is a member of uh, the Alzheimer's Association. He has a very good interest on the neuropharmacology and the studies. He has established many uh, uh, neuropharmacological uh, models for the screening of neurons. So with this uh, fast and short uh, introduction, I would like to say uh, his current research focuses on uh, novel effective drug development for Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease and epilepsy and uh, novel pharmacological actions of designer drugs and chemotherapy induced cognitive impairment. I welcome Dr. Murlikrishnan Damsekaran and I stop my uh, slide. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Murlikrishnan, there is a communication gap. I have uh, prepared a slide that has been mistakenly uh, uh, given uh, as a March and uh, that has been corrected and in informed to all uh, the Indian uh, people. But due to uh, yesterday and day before yesterday, due to some uh, government examinations, Rajasthan government has stopped internet connectivity in Alwar. So we could not be able to communicate it to you. Uh, the communication has not really reached to you. So I hand over this uh, stage to you now. I know uh, what difficulty you are facing. I'm sorry for that. Here, uh, my camera is also uh, interrupting. Uh, uh, so, Welcome, uh, Dr. Murli Krishnan. Please carry on, uh, make it as a slide show and uh, uh, start your uh, presentation. Yeah, it is right now. You may start it now, it is okay. talking about the neuroscience and the valid methodology. So I'm going to talk about these methods for two diseases, uh, two neurodegenerative diseases. And I was also thinking about epilepsy, but with regard to epilepsy, it's only a chemically induced animal model that we have, and a very little bit with regard to transgenic animal models with epilepsy. But the two big models that I really would like to talk about is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So to start with that, So whenever we think about a disease state, I just want to start with, we have to understand what is the structure, that is the anatomy, what is the function okay, of each structure, which is the physiology. Unless we understand the structure and function, uh, a pathology cannot be well established or explained. So it may be a problem with anatomy or physiology or both. So from a big point of view, whenever we think about, we have to make sure that an animal model contains both the structural abnormalities and physiological changes that leads to the pathology. So once we understand that, we can have an appropriate pharmacological approach and then think about adverse drug reaction, which can lead to a patient care. So the big question here is why? Why do you need a valid animal model? So to make sure that we have a, a appropriate pharmacological approach with minimal adverse effect and no hypersensitive reaction for patient care. So that is the global idea for having an animal model. So when you think about these two diseases, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, what is the most important thing? They are neurodegenerative diseases. So what do we mean by neurodegeneration? This is a good graph to see. As during the process of aging, there is decrease in the viability of the neuron. The neuronal viability decreases. So what makes Alzheimer's and Parkinson's different? It's the region of the brain, number one. Number two, it's the neurotransmitter that is involved. So with Parkinson's disease, it's mainly dopamine. So Parkinson's disease is a nigral dopaminergic neurodegenerative disorder, which leads to movement disorder. So now we have to have an animal model where we have a neurodegeneration, particularly dopaminergic neurodegeneration in substantia nigra, leading to dopamine depletion in striatum. Okay, that is the big picture. With regard to Alzheimer's disease, what is the concept? Again, you have neurodegeneration, but where is it occurring? In basalis minor midbrain region, where cholinergic neurodegeneration occurs, and that spreads to hippocampus and cortex, where you have a short-term and long-term memory deficit. So that, that big picture, let's have it in mind. Okay. 
So now one is a movement disorder, other one is a memory disorder. So when you again, I think about, I just would love to compare this because that first we could, we should understand the concepts behind these animal models. As I told you, anatomy, substantia nigra with regard to um, Parkinson's disease. And then you can see that for Alzheimer's, it is basalis minor, hippocampus, cortex, ventricles enlarge. And then we have another unique thing, deposition of proteins. When you think about Parkinson's disease, it's Lewy body, which has alpha synuclein. In Alzheimer's, it is beta amyloid and tau. So what is the most important thing with regard to beta amyloid and tau? Where is it getting deposited? So now we are talking about advanced. So when you think about beta amyloid, we have to understand that it is getting deposited outside the neuron and tau is getting deposited inside the neuron. Okay. So I will again emphasize that protein deposition where they are getting deposited. With regard to the symptoms, we all know that Parkinson's occurs because it's associated with movement disorder. Alzheimer's is associated with memory disorder, cognitive deficiency. In Parkinson's, you have bradykinesia, postural instability, gait problem, rigidity, and tremor. In Alzheimer's, it's short-term or long-term memory loss. But you also see behavioral changes, such as depression and psychosis. But I just want to make sure that you understand that with regard to the markers of neurodegeneration, for both the disease, it is similar. It's the same. You have oxidative stress, apoptosis, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, excited toxin. So that is the beauty of the disease. With regard to neurodegeneration, and there's a decrease in the number of neuronal survival during the process of aging, the markers of neurodegeneration are the same. Oxidative stress, apoptosis, mitochondrial dysfunction, inflammation, excited toxin. But then, both of them are genetic disease. Again, I just want to emphasize that when it comes to animal model, we want to understand that both of them, it's a neurodegenerative disease, but it's also a genetic disorder. The genes that are associated with these diseases are different. alpha synuclein Parkin, LRRK2, DJ1, and pink. Whereas for Alzheimer's, it's presenilin, amyloid precursor protein, precursor protein, SORL1, and APOE. So I just want to make sure that we understand the pathology, the progression is similar with regard to neurodegeneration, but the gene involvement is different. With regard to the neurochemistry, it is decrease in dopamine that leads to increased cholinergic neurotransmission in Parkinson's disease. Whereas in Alzheimer's, it is decreased cholinergic neurotransmission leading to increased glutamatergic or excitotoxicity. So that is the most important pathology I want to understand. I will emphasize that when it comes to the animal model. Both aging increases the risk. And then a beauty with Parkinson's is, I'm going to talk about it, decrease smoking decreases the risk. Whereas in cognitive impairment smoking, okay, you have increased risk with regard to cognitive impairment due to smoking. So this is the major concept I want to emphasize. So once we understand that, so again, we want to understand first, let me start with Parkinson's disease. It is a, it is a problem. Again, you understand there are movement disease, movement disorders can be a hypokinesia, hyperkinesia, uh, miscellaneous. One can be associated with the pyramidal syndrome, spasticity. Then you have basal ganglia disorders where you have the tremor, dystonia, myoclonus, chorea, and tics. And then you have the miscellaneous. And then you have cerebellar disorder, which is ataxia. So these are the various movement disorders. Pyramidal, basal ganglia, and then cerebellar, which leads to ataxia. So when you think about dopamine, again, what are the neurotransmitters involved? You have acetylcholine, serotonin, GABA, and glutamate. Okay. So when you think about Parkinson, the most important thing is it is associated with dopamine. Dopamine is associated with love, right? It's a neurotransmitter with affection. So now, so with regard to Parkinson's disease, as I told you, you do not not only have dopamine depletion, and because of dopamine depletion, a patient may also have mood disorder. Specifically, a patient may have depression. A patient may have depression. So then you have other symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease. So now when you think about Parkinson's disease, why is the problem occurring? So you have that. When you have a problem in the spinal cord, I mean the substantia nigra, the muscle contraction, right? It starts from the cortex, goes through the basal ganglia. From the basal ganglia, it goes to the brainstem and then spinal cord. From the spinal cord, we have peripheral nerves, the somatic and autonomic nervous system, which controls the 
movement of the muscle. So again, it starts from the cortex through the basal ganglia to the brainstem and spinal cord where the muscle contraction occurs through the peripheral nerves. So now when you think about the history of Parkinson's disease, it was Dr. Par it was Dr. Charco. Okay. You understood that? It was Dr. Charco who named the disease Parkinson. Because Dr. Parkinson was the first guy to write, to write about Parkinson's disease as shaking palsy. So that is the reason a French physician, Charco, named after the English physician Parkinson. But not till 1960s, we didn't have a clue about Parkinson's disease. It was in 1960s that Tetschiakoff, he found that this particular neurodegeneration, movement disorder, occurs because of dopamine depletion. So these are the celebrities, Muhammad Ali, Michael Fox, Hitler, you have the, the, la, the last pope, they all had Parkinson's disease. Okay? So whenever you think about a disease, we have to understand the anatomical aspect. So now we understood that it's the nigrostriatal tract. We understood that neurotransmitter affected dopamine, acetylcholine mainly. To a certain extent, you also have glutamate. You see excitotoxicity. Okay. And what are the other things that can increase the risk for neurodegeneration? So based on that, okay. So definitely we understand that there are four major pathways with regard to dopamine. The nigrostriatal, mesolimbic, mesocortical, and tuberinfundicular pathway. And then you also have two minor pathways, inserter, hypothalamus pathway and chemotrigger zone. So you all know that chemotrigger zone is associated with emesis. Insert the hypothalamus pathway is associated with sexual function. Tuber infundicular pathway is associated with prolactin secretion. Mesolimbic and mesocortical pathway is associated with positive and negative symptoms of Parkinson's, uh, sorry, negative symptoms of psychosis or schizophrenia. When you think about nigrostriatal pathway, it is the pathway that is associated with movement disorder. If the problem is in substantia nigra, it is Parkinson's disease. If the neurodegeneration is in the striatum, it is the un Huntington disease. So that is the beauty of this particular pathway. If the problem is in substantia nigra, it is Parkinson's disease. If it is in striatum, it is Huntington disease. So again, that makes the whole important substantia nigra. It starts with substantia nigra, ends with nucleus caudate testosterone. It controls the fine tuning of the body. So to understand any disease state, we have to understand the process of neurodegeneration. So it starts with the neuronal signal, neurotransmission. For any neurotransmission, you need a precursor, synthesizing enzyme, cofactor. Neurotransmitter is being synthesized. It has to be stored in the vesicle. Here we are talking about dopamine. So it is the vesicular monoamine transporters that helps that neurotransmitter to be stored in the vesicles. and then. You have calcium influx in the presynaptic neuron, leading to the release of neurotransmitter from the stored vesicle. And then these neurotransmitters, they can bind, these neurotransmitters can bind to the postsynaptic receptors or neurotransmission. So the neurotransmission doesn't stop there. For understanding in neuroscience, we have to understand that. So the effect of the neurotransmitter has to be terminated. You have degrading enzymes reuptake process and the stimulation of presynaptic receptor, which is usually a GI coupled receptor. Okay, fine. We understand the process of neurotransmission. So now with regard to dopamine, we have to understand with regard to Parkinson's disease, what is, how is dopamine being synthesized? From tyrosine, you have the conversion of tyrosine and amino acid to levodopa. So you have tyrosine hydroxylase in the presence of the cofactor tetrahydrobioptrin dopamine is being formed. Uh, L-dopa is being formed. Why is this step important? Because this is the rate limiting step. Once L-dopa is being formed, it is converted to dopamine by aromatic amino acid decarboxylase in the presence of pyridoxal phosphate. Again, why am I emphasizing that? When I have an animal model, I need two things. I want dopamine to be depleted, number one. Number two, I want the inhibition of tyrosine hydroxylase. So why am I talking about this when I have an animal model? When you think about Parkinson's disease, what is the most important marker? Decreased tyrosine hydroxylase activity or expression in substantia nigra, and you have dopamine depletion in the striatum. So if you have autopsied a human brain of a Parkinson's disease patient, in the substantia nigra, you have decreased tyrosine hydroxylase activity, and in the striatum, you have dopamine depletion. So now that makes it number one 
marker for a Parkinson's disease in an animal model. Again, I'm emphasizing that. Why am I talking about this particular slide? Okay, so again, I want to emphasize uh, the synthesis is substantia nigra. Dopamine is being stored in the vesicle. You have pre and post synaptic receptor. When it is being released in the synaptic cleft, it goes and binds to the dopamine receptor. Here, I'm talking about D2 receptor. And then the dopamine is being metabolized by two enzymes, monoamine oxidase B and catechol O methyltransferase. So you can see the motor, act, motor cortex pathway. Again, before we understand the animal model, so think about the motor cortex, basal ganglia, dopamine stimulates, and you can have that. It goes to the spinal cord, controlled muscle activity. In Parkinson's disease, in the basal ganglia, lack of dopamine. So what happens? You have no muscle control. Therefore, you have increased muscle tension. Am I right? Because of the increased muscle tension, you have rigidity, bradykinesia, postural instability, gait, and also you can have tremor because of increased acetylcholine. So number one, again, I'm emphasizing that other than dopamine, what do you need? You need protein accumulation. You have accumulation of Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies contains, uh, there are five proteins in Lewy body. One of the most significant protein in Lewy body is alpha synuclein. You have neurofilament, actin, okay, you have tau. So you have five proteins and then you see that ubiquitin is also present. That is a Lewy body. Okay, you can see that that is neurodegeneration in substantia nigra. Okay, substantia nigra, neurodegeneration. Again, decreased tyrosine oxidase expression. Altered glial activity. What is glial? It's supporting cells which are present in the CNS. They are non-neuronal cells. That's the most important thing. They, are, they give support, nourishment to the neuron. So you have altered glial activity. So again, we want to emphasize the Lewy body deposition. And decreased dopamine. Decreased dopamine and increased cholinergic neurotransmission. So again, to emphasize that, that is the neurochemical aspect. But when it comes to the neuro, what is the mechanism associated with neurotoxicity? You have oxidative stress. What do you mean by oxidative stress? Increased prooxidant and or decreased antioxidant. Very simple. There's a balance between prooxidant and antioxidant. When you have an increased prooxidant and decreased antioxidant, it can lead to oxidative stress which is very similar for inflammation and apoptosis. Inflammation also, you have pro-inflammatory markers, anti-inflammatory markers. In apoptosis also, you have pro-apoptotic uh, markers and anti-apoptotic markers. So when you have increased pro-inflammatory or pro-apoptotic markers, you can have inflammation or apoptosis. With regard to excitotoxicity, it's very important for us to understand. Why? Because excitotoxicity plays a very important role with neurodegeneration. What do you mean by exotic, excitotoxic? When glutamate binds to NMDA receptor, again, when glutamate binds to NMDA receptor, it leads to increased calcium influx. Because NMDA receptor is a ligand-gated ion channel receptor. What is the ligand? Glutamate. What is the ion channel for? Calcium. It increases calcium. So whenever there's a positive charge, what is going to happen? depolarization. So that causes neuronal excitation leading to excitotoxin. Therefore, we have an NMDA antagonist, am I right, to be used in the treatment of both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And common thing is myocardial dysfunction, particularly when it comes to Parkinson's disease. One of the most important marker of Parkinson's disease is decreased complex one activity. So what happens when you have decreased complex one activity? You have Depletion of ATP. ATP is not there. You are going to lead, it's going to lead to decreased neural viability, neurodegeneration, neurotoxicity, and neural death. So this is a very simple mechanism that we have to understand with regard to any advanced animal model. Yes, we have to have markers of oxidative stress, inflammation, apoptosis, excitotoxicity, and mitochondrial dysfunction in addition to protein, excess protein deposition. Okay? So now, based on that, so the sad story is we do not have any agents to decrease neurodegeneration. What is the current therapeutic approach? Increase dopaminergic neurotransmission. How do we do that? By using precursor for dopamine with aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, levodopa, carbidopa. We have amantadine, which can enhance, which can increase the release of dopamine or enhance the effect of dopamine. 
Then we have dopamine agonist, non-specific, specific, ergot, non-ergot derivative, or old or new dopamine agonist. Then we have drugs that inhibit the breakdown of dopamine, mono, monoamine oxidase D inhibitors, selegiline, rasagiline, scarlet inhibitors. So now we have the combo drugs, levodopa with these MAO or COMP inhibitors. Okay. Then we have anticholinergics. Why do we have anticholinergics? Because of decrease in dopamine, that may be increased cholinergic neurotransmission leading to tremor. If the patient has tremor, we know that that's because of increased cholinergic neurotransmission. So we use anticholinergic drugs. These are muscarinic and tans. So the current research is being focused on developing a novel animal model, which can have these qualities, all right? And where we can test these novel drugs, okay? What is the problem with the current medication? They cannot retard neurodegeneration. They cannot stop neurodegeneration. Am I right? So there is no regenerative properties. They cannot block oxidative stress, inflammation, apoptosis, excitoxidy, and mitochondrial dysfunction. That is the problem with the current therapeutic approach. So now we need to create an in vivo animal model. We want to have a novel in vivo animal model. So one of the first model was to develop 6-hydroxy dopamine, okay, to administer 6-hydroxy dopamine. So what happens when you administer 6-hydroxy dopamine, okay? So I'm going to show you that when you administer 6-hydroxy dopamine, which is a structure very similar to dopamine and levodopa, so what is going to happen is you are going to have 6-hydroxy dopamine administered to one side of the brain, okay? You can see that this is a very good picture to show that. 6-hydroxy dopamine, again, from a pharmacy point of view, it is not administered orally. Okay, good. It cannot cross the blood-brain barrier based on the structure. Again, we told that, a structure similar to that. So now what happens? What is the beauty of this animal model? It's one of the best animal models to study the behavioral studies. Usually what happens if you see the picture, 6-hydroxy dopamine is injected unilaterally in the nigrostriatal tract. Unilaterally means it is only injected one side. So what happens? Now I want you to understand when we talk about the animal model, it takes four weeks to have dopamine depletion in one side of the brain in the nigrostriatal tract. Again, try to understand that. How do we administer 6-hydroxy dopamine? Intrastriatally or by injecting them into the brain directly. Okay, We're injecting them directly into the brain. In one side of the brain, again, in one side of the brain, we have to wait for four weeks. So what happens? There is an imbalance between dopamine in one side of the brain and the other side of the brain. So what? It is the best animal model to test for a drug, whether a drug has dopamine agonist activity or a drug has a stimulant property. So if you administer a dopamine, if you administer a dopamine agonist, the animal is going to rotate. If you can see in this picture, the animal is going to rotate in the contralateral manner. What do you mean by that, contralateral? If you have lesion or if you have administered the 6-hydroxy dopamine in the right side, the animal will be rotating in the opposite direction, okay, contralateral, towards the opposite direction of the lesion or the administration of 6-hydroxy dopamine. You can see that. If you administer amphetamine, a drug which is a stimulant, or in other way, a drug that can increase the release of dopamine, the animal will be rotating ipsilaterally. So from a big picture, I want you to understand that. This is the best animal model that we currently have to test for an animal to see whether they have a dopamine agonist activity or they have a stimulant, amphetamine-like stimulant activity. Once you have an animal unilaterally administered 6-hydroxy dopamine, when you administer dopamine agonist or if you administer an unknown drug, a synthetic drug or a natural product, the animal rotates in the contralateral manner. It has a dopamine agonist activity. If the animal rotates ipsilaterally, okay, towards the lesion side, that drug has an amphetamine-like stimulant activity. Okay, so now, what is the advantage of this animal? Okay, yes, it can cause dopamine depletion, number one. Number two, you have a valid behavior, not the very well-accepted valid behavior. So it's it may be an old model, but still it's the gold model to have. Very good. Okay, from a big picture, yes. What are the problems? As a scientist, we just have to understand what are the problems with this. Yes, it's a surgical animal model. 
you still have to have the stereotaxic apparatus to understand how and where you have you have to know the y axis z axis and x axis exactly in the brain you have to have the stereotaxic apparatus to make sure that you administer 6 hydroxy dopamine very precisely in the nigrospinal tract that is the challenge with this animal model but still we have commercial vendors who sell this animal model okay but again the problem is unless you have around 70 to 80% of neurodegeneration you are not going to get a very valid animal model again i want you to understand that since it's a surgical approach the amount of neurodegeneration is varies from individualized animal okay that is the disadvantage of having this animal model okay good so now let's go to the very very famous and well accepted animal model mptp you see that one methyl four phenyl 1 2 3 4 tetrahydrocuridin that is mptp this is the best chemically induced animal model again i want to understand that other than mptp we also have paraquat manganese diquat these are all chemically induced parkinsonian animal model in vivo model when you think about that you have manganese okay very good paraquat and diquat what is the beauty of paraquat and diquat they are used in agriculture okay they can be herbicides pesticides what is the mechanism of action they inhibit complex 1 mitochondrial complex 1 leading to dopamine depletion they are all accepted but the best and one of the most valid animal model is mptp so now i just want you to talk about some history in roche in 1940s and 1950s used mptp to treat parkinson disease before we had all these fda and all these regulatory bodies so the question is why did roche use mptp to you be used in the treatment of parkinson disease and now we have mptp to induce a parkinson animal model. the beauty of mptp is when you administer the drug within few minutes it causes enhanced release of dopamine so now you understand that roche uses because when dopamine is being released with regard to parkinson disease patient initially the patient is going to feel good because there is increased dopaminergic neurotransmission but what is it going to do as you continuously treat it it's going to cause dopamine depletion are we clear on that so roche in 1940s and 50s used mptp suddenly they stopped it because initial dopamine release is there but later on what happens you have depletion of dopamine good now let me come back what happened what is history of mptp in 1979 there was the first case of mepridine okay mepridine based design and drugs a patient had used it in california in 1979 that particular person died and then they had autopsy in their brain they found some chemicals okay then they stopped it. in 1983 again they had several people who had parkinsonian symptoms and they passed away when they autopsy the brain they found this chemical mptp that is 1983 what did they do they took that mptp and injected to rodents monkeys so now the catch here is you can see from the slide mptp as such it is not neurotoxic it has to be converted to mpp plus by the enzyme monoamine oxidase b for animals that do not have monoamine oxidase b mptp will not induce neurotoxin what a beautiful animal model again i want to emphasize that mptp as such is not neurotoxic it has to be converted to its active neurotoxic metabolite that is mpp plus and that is being done by the enzyme monoamine oxidase b okay so animals that lacks mao b cannot be used as a model rat interestingly rat do not have mao b so what do you have to do for rat you have to like 6 hydroxy dopamine you have to administer mpv plus directly into the brain but for mice for studying any parkinson's disease etiology or a neuroprotective effect of any drug the best model that we have is mptp induced parkinsonian animal model so what is the advantage for 6 hydroxy dopamine what did i say you need 4 weeks to for it to have that symptoms whereas with regard to mptp you administer within 30 minutes you will see tremor 
but the problem there is the tremor is because of increased serotonin. Okay, but still, it is one of the most best model because you see tremor. Okay, good. Then what did we see? Within 24 hours, you'll see increased dopamine. But on fifth day to seven days, five to seven days, you will have 70 to 80 percent of dopamine depletion in the striatum. In the striatum, 70 to 80 percent, which mimics the Parkinson disease patient. So that is the beauty of this animal. And I talked about advanced animal model. I still believe this chemically induced Parkinsonian animal model is the best animal model. The reason being, within a week, I have an animal model. If I want to study the etiology, this is the best. And then with biochemistry, what is the most important thing I told you with regard to dopamine? I need dopamine depletion, but I also need inhibition of tyrosine hydroxylase activity, MPTP, significantly binds to tyrosine hydroxylase and inhibits tyrosine hydroxylase activity. Therefore, you have decreased dopamine synthesis. So MPTP by two mechanisms. One, it can enhance the release of dopamine and deplete dopamine from the vesicles. Good. The second one, it inhibits the formation of dopamine by inhibiting tyrosine hydroxylase activity. Good. So that makes MPTP the best, okay, chemically induced animal model. Okay, now I come to my third aspect. Okay, we have a chemically induced animal model. What did we talk about Parkinson disease? We talked about Parkinson disease. Neurodegeneration occurs because of protein deposition. One of the most important protein is alpha synuclein. Okay, so when you have, now we have transgenic animal model. Okay, you have a gene that is knocked out or knocked in. Okay, now you have alpha synuclein accumulation, aggregation, which can lead to decreased locomotor activity. So what is the picture that I'm talking about? We have chemically induced animal model. Now we are coming to genetic animal model. The genetics animal model, you have knockout or knock-in, various genes have been. But what is the thing that we are mainly seeing? It make, mimics Parkinson's disease related to decreased movement, okay? Decreased locomotor activity. But you also see aggregation of proteins, specifically like alpha synuclein. So there are various animal models. In these animal models, you also have, you also have dopamine depletion, tyros decreased tyroxine, hydroxylase expression or activity leading to decreased dopamine formation. But what is the major problem here? Again, it is expensive. These animal models are very expensive, transgenic animal models. Number two, it is not like MPTP where you can see an animal model within weeks. Here, it may take months this animal model can take from three to eight months to form. So you have to wait for eight months to have these animals to administer a drug to see the efficacy or potency for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So that is the biggest challenge here. Okay. So you have to make sure that you have, it can be a single transgenic animal model, double transgenic animal model, triple transgenic animal model. So now you have five genes that has, can be altered and you can have an animal model. So in Alzheimer's, I think we have a 5X animal model. Okay, good. So again, with regard to Parkinson's disease, okay, most important thing I have covered for Parkinson's disease, I have an animal model, which is the best animal model to see whether you can test for dopamine agonist or a stimulant activity based on the rotation. You cannot beat that animal model, one of the top most animal model. Number two, we had the classic, well-accepted animal model, MPTP. It's a chemically induced animal model. So other than MPTP, what other chemicals can be used? You can use manganese, paraquat, diquat, am I right? So these are all complex one inhibitors, herbicides. Environmental exposure to Parkinson's disease, they can mimic those things, manganese, okay? And then we have some transgenic animal model, okay? So that is with Parkinson's disease. Then I thought, let me bridge between two of them, okay? Then you have in silico, and then you have in vitro animal model. Sorry about that. It's not anatomical aspect, it's in vitro. So now, as a scientist, I want to emphasize that for all of you, now try to understand the in silico animal model. In silico models that we have, I don't want to use the animal model, in silico model. These models are very important for us to make uh, animal model. For example, I know that MPP plus or MPTP will bind to tyrosine hydroxylase, the active site of tyrosine hydroxylase, Therefore, it can affect the tyrosine hydroxylase activity. So before even I want to try a chemically induced animal model for Parkinson's disease, I want to see 
whether my toxin, neurotoxin, can bind to tyrosine oxide. So if it can bind, you definitely expect either the drug to increase the activity or inhibit the tyrosine oxide factor. So by doing an in silico method, what all can I find? Yes, I need a neurotoxin. So what is the most important criteria for a neurotoxin? It has to be lipophilic. Why should that drug be lipophilic? If I want administered it orally or by intraperitoneal route, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. So one of the most important pharmacokinetic effect we need is absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. You need the drug to effectively cross the blood-brain barrier to bind to a target the cell nerve system. In Parkinson's disease, the target is tyrosine hydroxylase. So I need a drug that can inhibit tyrosine hydroxylase activity. So pharmacodynamically, yes, we have the tyrosine hydroxylase protein well characterized. Now throw in a drug in an in silico method, okay? With computational techniques, you can see whether the drug ha can bind effectively to tyrosine hydroxylase. Once you know that it binds, you can expect an increase or uh, inhibitory effect of the drug. So that is the beauty of in silico method. So when you think about developing any animal model with a chemical, make sure that we can do an in silico study. For example, when it comes to Alzheimer's, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, if you want to use a chemically induced dementia model, current model we have are two models, okay? One, streptozotosin. Okay, streptozotosin can be administered intra, intraperitoneally or directly into the brain, am I right? Then we have scopolamine. We have scopolamine, which can be administered okay, to the animal. So scopolamine is a classical muscarinic antagonist and atropine derivative. Streptosotosin, it can increase all right, the blood glucose level, hyperglycemia, which can lead to cognitive impairment. So in silico model will predict the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic effect of these neurotoxins. And also you can predict the target which they bind. And then you can make sure that before even you go to the insulin in vivo things, you can have that model. Okay, that is in silico. When it comes to in vitro animal model, we have several dopaminergic cells. We have several dopaminergic neuronal cells, which have been derived from humans or from rodents. So currently, we work with a lot of dopaminergic cells. So what is the advantage? Yes, I have done the in silico model. What is the next step? Can they inhibit the growth of the dopaminergic neuronal cells? Very important for us to find. So if I have MPP+, plus, incubate MPP+, plus with the dopaminergic neurons. So what is the effect that you're expecting? Time-dependent and dose-dependent inhibition of neuronal, dopaminergic neuronal viability. So what is the big picture now we are trying to see? We want to see whether your neurotoxins can significantly inhibit the neuronal viability. Very important in an in vitro animal model. So in in vitro model. So in an in vitro model, when it inhibits, the next step I can do is I can study the markers of neurotoxin, study the markers of oxidative stress, apoptosis, inflammation, excitopoxia, and mitochondrial dysfunction. So that is the advantage of using in vitro cells. So we can study the dose-dependent and time-dependent effect of a neurotoxin, specifically if you want to see on the dopaminergic neurons. And then you also can understand the mechanism of neurodegeneration and neurotoxicity. You can study the markers of oxidative stress, apoptosis, the effect on tyrosine hydroxylase, sixth marker. Okay, so that is the beauty of using an in vitro method. Okay, so now when it comes to dementia, we talk about cognitive impairment. It is not a specific disease, it is a group of symptoms affecting memory, thinking, and social ability, which can significantly interfere with daily function. So there are different types of dementia. You all know that. The most common form or the most uh, prevalent form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So when you think about de dementia, a patient forgets the entire experience quickly. They do not remember. They cannot follow direction. They cannot take care of themselves. That is the major difference between dementia and aging. So again, I just want to emphasize, you can have an animal mod. If an animal is going to live for two, three years, if you have an animal, a aged animal, it also can have cognitive impairment. But that's different from the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So again, 
which part of the brain it is affected. I just want you to understand that you have the ventricles, okay? You will you'll see enlarged ventricles when you see neurodegeneration. That's the shrinking of the brain, okay? You have, what are the two major areas? We talked about cortex and hippocampus. Hippocampus is associated with short-term short -term memory and cortex is associated with long-term memory. I'll talk about this animal model quickly, okay? Again, it is a irreversible. I just want like Parkinson disease, Alzheimer's is also a irreversible disease, okay? Where you have cognitive impairment, neuropsychiatric change, okay? This is a memory impairment, cognitive impairment. In Parkinson disease, it was a movement disorder. So again, the problem is a basalis forebrain, the basalis minor, that the neurodegeneration is also seen in cerebral cortex and hippocampus, where you have short-term and long-term loss of memory. With regard to neuropathology, two proteins I want to emphasize. Beta amyloid, beta amyloid is deposited outside and tar protein is inside. So because of these accumulation of the proteins, which can lead to neurodegeneration. So two major markers, beta amyloid and you have tau protein, okay? So with regard to beta amyloid, you have two secretase, alpha and beta secretase. So beta secretase and gamma secretase are two enzymes that is associated with the formation of beta amyloid, okay? So beta and gamma secretase. And then you have the mechanism. So when you see beta amyloid aggregation, it can affect the NMDA receptor. We talked about that. It can enhance calcium influx, causing uh, excitotoxicity. And not only that, you have increased neuroinflammatory markers, pro neuroinflammatory markers. You have increased reactive oxygen species generation, which can lead to apoptosis. So, this beta amyloid can lead to oxidative stress, inflammation, and apoptosis and excitotoxicity. So now you can understand the importance of beta amyloid with regard to Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So currently we have coronastase inhibitors, NMDA receptor antagonists, and we also have one new drug, okay, which is focused monoclonal antibody against beta amyloid. So now you can understand when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, it's much more complicated. Okay. It's a complex neurodegeneration as compared to Alzheimer's. It's a complex neurodegenerative disorder with a multifaceted pathogenesis. There's a lot of mechanisms that can lead to neurodegeneration. With regard to Alzheimer's, it's much more simpler, but here it's more complex, okay? So here I have a double, I'm going to start with the double transgenic mice, okay? But I'm going to start with a transgenic animal model. So I just want to go back to the history. Initially, it started with a single transgenic animal model. Then we had double, double transgenic, then we had triple transgenic, then we have a five, okay, five gene altered animal, five X transgenic animal model. So, so I want to talk to you about a single animal model. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the advantage and disadvantage. In this, okay, animal model, uh, amyloid precursor uh, protein and presenilin uh, uh, transgenic animal model, you have deposition of beta amyloid. But in this animal model, why am I talking about this classical model is, it takes two to four months to see beta accumulation in the brain. Are you guys with me? So this is a single uh, uh, transgenic animal model. It takes around six to eight months. In a double transgenic animal model, it takes two to four months for you to see protein accumulation leading to cognitive impairment. Whereas if it is a 5X transgenic animal model, you can see the pathology within four to six weeks. So now you can understand the advancement of the neuroscience. So it depends upon how many genes have been altered, how many transgenic genes are there. So as I told you, if it's a single gene, it takes six to eight months. If it's a double gene, two to four months for you to see the protein accumulation associated with the cognitive impairment. With the Phi-X animal model, you can see that within four to six weeks. So what is the most important thing I told you? Here you have beta amyloid content increase. That is because of increased beta secretase activity. I think this is one of the best animal models that can be correlated. So what is the concept here? You need protein accumulation. Which protein are we talking about? Beta amyloid accumulation, okay? In the neurons or in the brain. Specifically, which region of the brain are we talking about? Cortex and hippocampus. Why? Because cortex and hippocampus is associated with short-term and long-term memory or cortex long-term, hippocampus short-term memory. So what happens when you have increased beta secretase? When you have increased beta secretase activity, you will have increased beta amyloid deposition. 
So that is the reason you can see that with regard to the age and with regard to that region, you have enhanced beta amyloid production because, or accumulation because of the increased in beta secretase activity. So that makes this animal model solid. So then not only that, you have various markers associated with neurotoxicity. What are the markers? This is beauty. You have increased cyclooxygenase activity. When you see the inflammatory pathway, there are two enzymes I wanted to focus on. One is phospholipase A2. Okay, I'm right. Arachidonic acid is being formed from phospholipids. The formation of arachidonic acid is being done by phospholipase. Then arachidonic acid is being broken down by cyclooxygenase to form prostaglandins, prostacyclins, thromboxane. So COX plays a very important role, which can cause increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. So with this marker, you have increased cyclooxygenase. This animal model did not have any change in the monoaminoxidase activity, but you can see that it increased reactive oxygen species. That clearly tells you that there's increased oxidative stress. It depleted superoxide dismutase. When you have a decrease in antioxidant enzyme, that's going to increase oxidative stress. So now what is the net effect when you have oxidative stress? It has to increase lipid peroxidation. Yes, we had an increased lipoxide, lip, uh, lipo lipid lipoxide formation. So that clearly says that this is a good animal model, not only with regard to the protein deposition, but also with regard to the markers of neurotoxicity. Okay. Then we also show that these markers, like TNF alpha, which is a significant uh, inflammatory marker, pro inflammatory marker. So in these animals, you have increased TNF alpha, the cortex and hippocampus. Okay. And also you have other interleukins, other cytokines, pro inflammatory cytokines getting increased in the cortex and hippocampus specifically. Okay. Now let's stop there. And what is the most important thing with regard to Alzheimer's toxicity? We use memantine. What is memantine? It is a NMDA antagonist. Why should we use that? Because we want to prove that. The electrophysiology, we are proving that in these animal models, advanced animal models, you see excitotoxicity, which is leading to cognitive impairment. You can see that this electro electrophysiological technique where we see that the neuronal firings are definitely altered. That is excitotoxicity. Okay. And that is alteration in the NMD receptor, NR2B, NR2A, and NR1, which is leading to excitotoxicity. So this is a very important marker with regard to advanced model for. Alzheimer's disease. So now all these have to be translated to a behavioral disease. Yes, I have all these markers. I have oxidative stress. I have inflammation, excitotoxicity, beta amyloid accumulation. I have all these markers, but it has to lead to a cognitive difference, cognitive impairment. Yes, with regard to ambulatory movement, you have enhanced ambulatory movement. You have definitely a cognitive deficit as seen in y -mace. Okay. So when you think about the toxicity, Again, a big picture, you see behavioral deficits. You see excited, excited oxidity. Not only that, we measure the electrophysiology. We also have, we show that there is alteration in glutamate and GABA levels leading to excitoxicity. You have inflammation because of increased pro-inflammatory markers. And then you have synaptic plasticity problems. So the neuro signaling is not occurring. You have oxidative stress. That leads to neurodegeneration. So it's a very advanced animal model to study the markers of Alzheimer's disease and also to study this model can be used to test various drugs for neuroprotection or neurotoxicity. So when you think about this particular animal model, you can see that this double, double transgenic mice have increased secretase activity. You have microglial activation, T-cell stimulation. So therefore, you have increased post-inflammatory uh, marker formation which can lead to inflammation, can affect mitochondria. You have increased oxidative stress because of reactive oxygen species. Okay, you have A beta formation, which can lead to neurodegeneration, behavioral impairment and neurodegeneration. Okay, with this, I'm going to stop. Now, always my favorite question is what's preferable, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? Parkinson's, it's better to spill half peg of your scotch than to forget where you kept the bottle. So I still believe it's preferable to have Parkinson than Alzheimer's disease, okay? Alzheimer's disease is death before death, and I'm terrified of it. That's a very famous quote. Again, I would like to thank all my collaborators and lab, uh, lab mates, but my talk I would like to sincerely dedicate to my mentor, Dr. Paul William. 
Thank you, Jayvalan, sir, for this great opportunity. I'm happy to answer your questions, guys. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Murli Krishnan. Um, though there is a uh, lesson from our side on a short notice, you have uh, prepared it and uh, you have done it. No uh, problem, sir. No with problems. The, with the justification. And uh, I think uh, uh, in the last moment, uh, there are a lot of uh, students joining this webinar. So uh, thank you all of you uh, for joining this. Uh, you can also uh, watch the entire uh, talk in the YouTube uh, channel of Alur Pharmacy College that is available. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murli Krishnan, for a wonderful uh, talk on uh, the different model, animal models for neurodegenerative disorders. Thank you. And uh, if there is any questions uh, from student side or from the audience side, uh, there are a lot of uh, teachers I am seeing uh, they may also uh, ask questions uh, so that it will be uh, clear for you. Uh, if there is any questions, if anybody wants to ask anything, please raise your hands. I will make you uh, uh, unmute uh, to ask the questions. Please raise your hands. Or you can also, uh, I'll also uh, open uh, on the chat, you can type your questions in the chat also. So it is open now. Please uh, type your questions, otherwise it is already uh, well, uh, in uh, US. Dr. Murli Krishnan is awake for us in the midnight. Any questions? Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, wind up. Uh, you can type uh, your message here in the chat. Or so, Dr. Jnana Chandran is uh, mentioning about monkeys as animal models. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, it's a great question, sir. Very great question. With you. When you think about monkey versus animal models, um, uh, monkeys are the. That's a good question. Advantage: monkeys are the closest to the human. It mimics the human very much when it comes to the anatomy and physiology. The problem with monkeys are uh, the number one, the cost. Number two, uh, transgenic monkeys are not available still now. So with regard to monkey. We still have to use it as an aging animal model, or we have to use it as a chemically induced animal model. So we can administer MPTP to the animals. That's the best animal model to study. The problem is with regard to the monkeys, uh, we cannot use them for a short study. You have to use a drug, then you have to wait. You have to give a kind of a, a period where the drug is gone. Then you have to start the next drug. So it's a time consuming, cost very expensive. Very few facilities get approval to handle monkeys. Because when we think about monkeys, yes, we have very small monkeys within three to four pounds, and then we can have till 10 to 15 kilograms. So yes, we have different sizes of monkeys to use, different monkey species. But uh, when it comes, the problem uh, is now FDA doesn't want us to go to a monkey before we get into the human trial. You have any pharmacological trial, okay, an acute or a long time trial, you can have it with rodents, you can have it with dogs, you don't need monkeys, okay? So when you think about that, uh, definitely uh, the rodent animal models are very easy because we can create a transgenic animal model. It is less expensive, and then it can be much more faster to develop an animal model to test a drug or to study the etiopathology of disease. To test a drug or to study the etiopathology of disease, uh, a rodent model may be much more easier. So... Then next question I have is C57 uh, depends, depends, okay? With regard to Parkinson's disease, I prefer C57 because it has 
monoamine oxidase B. Because when you administer MPTP, it has to be converted to MPP+. plus. So definitely C57BL6 is better. But then when it comes to other markers, other uh, animal, other uh, uh, species may be much more better. But yes, definitely when it comes to MPTP, Parkinson disease, I prefer C57BL6. I'm positive that within a week, you'll have dopamine depletion. So it's, it's a great animal. Uh, for students and everybody, now make sure that you understand the in silico animal model. It's an excellent, it's an excellent uh, a tool to study the pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic effect of a drugs. So with regard to the next question is administration of cereals. Yeah, for 6-hydroxy dopamine, that's what I told you. It's a great animal model, but if you don't know stereotaxic, uh, how to handle the stereotaxic apparatus, very expensive uh, tool. That particular map of the brain, it's a very expensive book to buy. It's a good question. Yes, I don't think, you know, just administering and administrating 6-hydroxy dopamine in the whole brain, does it make it as a very valid animal model. That is the reason I have to be very skeptical when you talk about 6-hydroxy dopamine. Yes, you have to know about stereotaxic. You have to be very precise and specific to administer specifically in substantia nigra. Substantia nigra in mice is only 8 to 10 milligram. In rat, it may be 30 to 40 milligrams. It's a very small region of the brain. So yes, it's very difficult with regard to stereotaxis, but it is one of the great models. Thank you. Thank you, yes, uh, Dr. Gaurav Kumar, for your question. And uh, when, when, when plus 7T, uh, I, don't, I don't know the name of uh, the participant. Is there any other question? Otherwise, uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, Dr. Murlikrishnan, for uh, a very wonderful session here uh, you have uh, given to us. You have uh, given your time. So on a Sunday evening, May I stop your uh, sharing, sir? Uh, yes, sir, please, sir. So, uh, with stopping the uh, screen, uh, I thank you uh, once again for giving this uh, presentation to us. So now, uh, we'll move on to uh, this part of uh, this uh, end up of the session with the thanks from. Uh, our administration side. Uh, they are discussed. So we'll move on uh, to the next part. Uh, I'll share the, the, the next slide. That is the national anthem. Please, as far as the national anthem, we'll move on to the next part. Janagana mana adhina yaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Utkada Vanga Vindya Himachala Yamuna Ganga Utchala Jaladhita Ranga Tavashubha Name Jage Tavashubha Ashish Mange Gahe Tavajaya Gatha Janagana Mangala Dayak Jayahe Bharat Bhagya Vibhata Jayahe 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 Thank you, Dr. Murli. Uh, I'll end up this session now. Thank you, I love you.